I'm pleased to welcome everyone here today to our House of Learning lecture series and as well as hopefully um, you'll get the chance to um, go view the exhibit today. And um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Durden. Rick Durden is Associate Professor in the English Department at Brigham Young University. He has published several studies of the English Bible from its early translators such as William Tyndale and Miles Coverdale to its impact on literature and on politics in the 16th and 17th centuries. He is a founding member of the Tyndale Society and serves on the editorial board of the journal Reformation. And I'll now turn the time over to Professor Durden. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the library, to Scott Duvall, to Maggie Kopp for, the, for a very impressive exhibition and to all of you for coming, for people who are willing and eager to keep learning about a book you already know very well. Sometime between last March and next February, the King James Version of the Bible turns 400. The, let's get this thing moving, there we go. Happy birthday to you. The, is there a more influential, important, text than this one? What book has more changed our language, our literature, our music, our culture, our society, our political structures than this one? The Bible, in the Geneva version, not the King James version, is Shakespeare's most important source. But not only that, and perhaps more important, the early translators gave the English tongue a richness, expression, and vitality which it had lacked. Without Tyndale, no Shakespeare. In literature, Milton, Bunyan, Defoe, Blake, the Brontes, Melville, Whitman, Dickinson, Eliot, Steinbeck. Where did Toni Morrison get titles and language for books like Beloved or Song of Solomon? And in expected and unexpected places, this book is the deepest of influences. Where would African American literature and culture be without this book? Surprisingly enough, even people like D.H. Lawrence find that the resonances of the Bible uh, come through into their prose. The Bible has inspired music from medieval plain song to Bach St. Matthew's Passion from the Messiah to Bob Marley, whose languages and lyrics are full of Bible references, from, uh, from us and them, we and them, to Exodus. Bob Marley was buried with his favorite copy of the King James Version of the Bible. Where would Bono be without the, his Christian struggles? You know U2's song, 40. It's the 40th Psalm that it draws on. When Lauren Hill won a Grammy for the miseducation of Lauren Hill in accepting it, she recited the 40th Psalm. And in popular culture, still in our oh so secular age, the King James Version retains its hold. Verses from Luke are the culmination of a Charlie Brown's Christmas. In Chariots of Fire, Eric Little quotes Isaiah 40. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. The title comes from 2 Kings, chapter 2. In Pulp Fiction, the character Jules Winfield quotes, and sometimes misquotes, Ezekiel, chapter 25, verse 17. In the book of Eli, a last copy of the King James Version is the one hope for post-apocalyptic humanity. The King James Version is a prose monument. It established the style and register of language, which to us sounds like authority. Its verses are beautiful and they've inspired literature, music, and art. But of course, we revere it also because it teaches us the way back to God. So go next door. Stand with your nose pressed against the glass in that exhibit, face to face with the 1611 King James Version and the library's really cool collection. A great Bible, a Geneva Bible, a Bishop's Bible. 
You all know how we got the Book of Mormon. You know the stories of 14-year-olds hiding in the cornfields to save copies of the Book of Commandments so that we get a Doctrine and Covenants. But few know how we got a Bible that we could read. How did we get an English Bible? What made it possible for Joseph Smith to read, If Any of You Lack Wisdom, rather than, Si quis autum vestrum indigit sapientia postulate adeo? Would a plowboy have read that? Fat chance. Who gave us the book? Well, in the dedication that's still prefaced to our copies of the Bible, we read that King James is the principal mover and author of the work. Not only that, he's even the immediate author of our true happiness. Wow. <laughs> and on the seventh day, he rested. <laughs> no, astonishingly, our Bible is the work not of one author, but of many hands. It may be the exception to our cynical rule that nothing of value comes out of committee work. And even the translators themselves acknowledged that they stood on the shoulders of great scholars and martyrs who preceded them. What usually goes unacknowledged is the fact that our Bible emerges from struggle, and it bears the scars of that struggle all the way down to its language and phrases. The real, the full story of the English Bible is rich and complicated. It's a story of the rise of new technologies, of the rise of Renaissance humanism and scholarship, of jealously guarded powers, both religious and secular, of doctrines and heresies, ideologies and revolutionaries. Out of all that, I'd like to focus on traces in the history and in the text that can remind us of the religious and political struggles. Just beneath the peace and serenity we find in the Bible, we can also find tensions, turmoil, compromises, anguished decisions, however rendered calmly and coolly they may be. We can understand the history leading up to the King James Version as a kind of push and pull between change and reaction, opening up the Bible and closing it off, challenging the powers that be versus preserving the status quo. We'll talk about most of these as they swing from uh, progressive to conservative. We have a Bible, first of all, because God speaks to his people. That made them unique in the ancient world. Other peoples had, and cultures had gods. They could show you their images. But the Hebrew God was unique, the God who speaks. To his covenant people, he spoke Hebrew. And the New Testament was written in Greek. In the late fourth century, Jerome translated the Hebrew and Greek into Latin, the common tongue of the Roman Empire and of early Christianity so that everyone could read the word of God. And for a thousand years, the Bible was Latin. Some bits were rendered into Anglo-Saxon and Middle English, but never much, never from the original Hebrew or Greek and never an entire Bible. Because an effort in 1380 by John Wycliffe and companions to translate the Bible into English was seen as part of the unrest, which led to the Peasants' Rebellion, English Bibles were outlawed. So when we reach early modern England, the 16th century, we find that Tudor England had inherited a politicized view of the English Bible. The idea of translating the Bible into the vernacular was anathema to the empowered, who feared lest such critical doctrines and such a potent authority be subjected to the judgment of the people. Translating scripture or even reading it in translation without episcopal or conciliar authorization was not only heretical and subversive to church rule, it was legally treason against the king. Early in the 15th century, to quell Lollardy, Parliament passed what Fox called this most blasphemous and cruel act to be as a law forever, that whatsoever they were that should read the scriptures in the mother tongue should forfeit land, cattle, body, life, and goods from their heirs forever and so be condemned for heretics to God, enemies to the crown, and most errant traitors to the land. They could recant, but if in any case they would not give over or were after their pardon relapsed, they should suffer death in two manner of kinds. First be hanged for treason against the king, and then burned for heresy against God. They got to kill you twice. Reading scripture 
had long been seen as a political and not just a religious act. And for most, reading scripture in their own language was an illegal, heretical, and even treasonous act. Who then gave us a Bible that we could read in English? I hope you know the story of William Tyndale, the young Oxford graduate who went back home to Gloucestershire and got into an argument with a parish priest and told him, if God spare my life, ere many years I will cause a boy that driveth a plow shall know more of the scriptures than thou dost. Truly, the towering figure in our story is William Tyndale. If you don't know it, learn his story of dedication and sacrifice. I hope you know of the great Catholic reformer Erasmus, the leading humanist of Northern Europe, who in 1516 produced a new Latin translation of the New Testament with a critical new Greek text, a work of scholarship which could indeed remake the religious landscape. And so he called it Novum Instrumentum, the new instrument. Not only a testament, but an instrument, a tool for social change and for moral and spiritual conversion. The Greek text enabled Tyndale to translate. To do that, he had to leave England, where translating was illegal. But in Cologne, he began. However, there the, the printers got drunk and told everyone that they were printing a book that was going to make all of England Lutheran. The authorities raided the press. Tyndale escaped with only the first 22 chapters of the book of Matthew in print. But this book was soon as a pamphlet circulating in England, smuggled in bales of cloth and barrels of grain. By 1525, Tyndale had cut back on his plans for a fully annotated and glossed uh, edition of scripture and published the first complete New Testament in English, translated from the original tongue and in print for all. There are not many copies of this book. The book is rare. How could that be, a book that people loved so much? It is rare because it was loved. Those who loved it read it to pieces or hid it from the authorities because the authorities feared it and destroyed it. Within weeks, Cardinal Wolsey had summoned the bishops who agreed to burn the books and punish their readers. The Bishop of London issued an injunction to the booksellers. Then at Paul's Cross, preached a public sermon against the translation. Imagine, a sermon against the New Testament which ended with the burning of copies of the New Testament. The next year, the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, employed a scheme for buying up copies of the English New Testaments in order to burn or destroy them. The year after that, the Bishop of London was trying to buy up copies. And here the story takes a comic turn. In Hall's Chronicle, we find that the Bishop of London met a merchant named Augustine Packington, who said, I know Tyndale, and I can procure you copies. Do so, the Bishop said, for they are not. They are naughty, <laughs> and I will surely burn them. So Hall concludes here at the bottom, and so forward went the bargain. The bishop had the books, Packington had the thanks, and Tyndale had the money. The Bishop of London inadvertently financed the next two printings. <laughs> the Bishop of London's mindset was the manuscript mindset. If you burn a manuscript, you destroy weeks or months of a man's life. But mass production changed the dissemination of God's word. Thomas More also distrusted lay reading because a Bible reader must be trained, initiated into the community of the faithful to have knowledge sufficient to understand. His concern was not that the English language was inadequate, but the human comprehension is that God's intention is not always easy to grasp. He flirts with the idea that scripture is so dangerous that it might be best kept out of all tongues and out of learned men's hands too. Modern commentators never quite hide their distaste for the intolerant partisanship in Thomas More's voluminous disputes with William Tyndale. But More is a very apt reader of theological implications. He knows what this translation will do to the consensus of the faithful. Moore doesn't see Tyndale's New Testament as rendering of a single book, the Bible, from one language to another. He believes Tyndale has produced a different book. 
Whoso calleth it the New Testament calleth it by a wrong name, except they'll call it Tyndale's Testament or Luther's Testament. Moore sees this novelty not as the work of an individual, as we have tended to do. He sees it rather as the work of an interest group or faction, and more to his point, the wrong faction. The confederacy between Luther and him is a thing well known and plainly confessed by such as have been taken and convicted here of heresy coming from thence. If Tyndale is a heretic, no amount of philological ability will make the text acceptable. Moore observes not, that it is, not just that it is difficult, but that it is dangerous to translate the text of scripture out of one tongue into another. And yet Moore and Tyndale were executed within weeks of each other in 1535. Tyndale then gives us the first draft of the King James Version of the Bible. He was executed before he could complete his work in Hebrew, among the first translations from Hebrew ever done and published in English. But uh, one of his friends, John Rogers, gathered the manuscripts and made sure that even such of the Old Testament as was completed and unpublished would make it into print. There in Matthew's Bible, we have all that Tyndale completed in his lifetime with a large ornamental initials, WT, at the end of the Old Testament to signal whose translation this really was. In translating the Bible into English, Tyndale not only put the truth in the hands of the ministers and the people, and he not only polished our language to a hard, clear, diamond-like luster, but he also unleashed the single most powerful ideological force of the last 500 years. Even in Tyndale's own century, scripture was seen as a power, and it was regarded as a power that could be passed on or even seized. In symbolic ways, scriptural authority was bestowed on people. First, especially during Henry VIII's reign, scripture was proffered to the monarch. But within a generation, people found that its power could be wielded by a minister. Finally, by the end of the century, the power and authority associated with the Bible could be claimed by and disseminated to the populace. There's a lot of history in that series of shifts, but let me mark just a couple of specific points. And if there's time, we could come back to some of the others later so that you can see the direction things went. First, as the medieval church is symbolically stripped of scripture because they had kept it from the people. Then as the monarch is portrayed as the possessor and dispenser of scriptural authority. Then as ministers began to turn scripture against rulers. And finally, as the people assumed an authority to question and to call for change. Tyndale sets in motion the symbolic gestures that deny Rome's authority by dispossessing Rome of scripture. The pope, cardinals, and bishops, he says, will challenge by, ask, by saying, all authority is ours, the scripture pertaineth unto us, and is our possession. Whence therefore hast thou thine authority, will they say? And his translation and he respond, for the scripture is God's, and theirs that believe, and not the false prophets. Miles Coverdale, who translates the first complete Bible into English, and gets it printed in 1535, even before Tyndale has gone to the stake, repeats the pattern set by Tyndale. In his prologue to the first complete English Bible, he urges that the immediate current purpose of English scripture is to subvert the authority of the church. Moreover, he insists that the ecclesiastical hierarchy have suppressed scripture so that they will not be dethroned. The papacy is guilty of suppressing, keeping secret, and burning the word of faith lest it should be known how they have defrauded Christian kings and princes of their due obedience, and lest we, your grace's subjects, should have eyes in the word of God. As a source and sign of authority, an English Bible does not only destroy, it enables. While it undermines the current ecclesiastical power, it underwrites monarchical authority. The word of God, he says, is a power. In the bottom phrase here, uses 16 verbs to talk about what scripture does. 
the force that it performs. He's explicit about the practical impact of vernacular scripture. It's the cause of felicity. It brings goodness. It brings learning. It engenders understanding. It causes good works. It makes us obey. It teaches estates their offices. It sets everything in frame, causes all prosperity, lightens darkness, comforts hearts, leaves no poor man unhelped, suffers nothing amiss unamended, lets no prince be disobeyed, permits no heresy to be preached, but reformeth all things, amendeth what is amiss, and sets everything in order. Therefore, this force, this authority, this power, can offer increased authority to Henry VIII, to whom Coverdale dedicates his translation. He says, the scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New, declareth most abundantly that the office, authority, and power given of God unto kings is in earth above all other powers. Considering then your imperial majesty not only to be my natural sovereign liege lord, I thought it my duty when I had translated this Bible not only to dedicate it to your highness, but wholly to commit it unto you. Henry thus joins in the work of translation, as he too is in and joined to apply all his study and endeavor to set forth God's word in English and give it free course throughout all Christendom. Reciprocally, the translations join in the work of monarchy as they legitimate Henry's kingship and supremacy. Monarchy advocates scripture. Scripture advances monarchy. Rhetorically, the reformers and translators have once again offered the authority of Holy Writ to the king. Because Henry's now supreme head of the church, Coverdale can even give the text of scripture to Henry for judgment, correction, and dispensing. Iconographically, this authority is represented by Hans Holbein the Younger on the title page that precedes Coverdale's dedication. The engraved border chronicles the dispensing of the word. The word proceeds from the word, the tetragrammaton, centered atop the engraving. From God, the old dispensation of the word descends down the left border, from Adam and Eve, tempted by the serpent, to Moses, who receives the law for fallen man, uh, to Ezra, the high priest. The new dispensation of the word proceeds from God down the right border of the engraving, from Christ, the new Adam, crushing the head of the serpent, to Christ as he sends the apostles into the world to preach the word, to Peter, preaching on the day of Pentecost, when tongues of fire rested on each of the apostles. As the apostles are sent to preach, all of them, not Peter alone, carry the keys that bind and loose. Thus, Holbein includes the Protestant claim that the authority of the church is none other than ministering the word. The borders lead to the scene of a final unified dispensation portrayed in the bottom border. The translation of the complete Bible and its committal into the hands of the king enable a new dispensation of the word. On the left side of the king, which is also the side of the old law, kneel the clergy receiving the Bible from the king. The scroll enfolding the clergy suggests how they should receive spiritual counsel, though it remains unclear whether the counsel is meant to come from God or from the king. Oh, how sweet are thy words unto my throat, yea, more than honey. The laity's rise in church leadership under Cromwell may be suggested by the lords of the realm on the side of the new law. The scroll enfolding them reads in Latin, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Holbein's engraving presents the dispensing of the word from two sources, God, above and in the center, and Henry VIII, below and in the center. Coverdale writes in the dedication, the scripture declareth plainly that as there is nothing above God, so there is no man above the king in his realm. The title page declares it just as plainly. In 1539, the government not only licensed but authorized a translation, the Great Bible. On the title page of the Great Bible, Henry actually takes God's place. God remains, a small and almost unnoticed figure looking benevolently from the upper edge of the engraving, but centered in the upper border is Henry VIII. From this position of authority, he dispenses copies of the Verbum Dei to Archbishop Cranmer on his right hand and Thomas Cromwell on his left. In the side borders, like the priests and apostles in the 1535 title page, Cranmer and Cromwell pass the word further. Cranmer presents it to a kneeling priest, Cromwell to a group of nobles. The word reaches the populace in the lower border and produces the desired result of vernacular scripture. The commons cry, vivat rex, and the children who don't know Latin say, God save the king. The great Bible title page, you'll notice, dispenses with those firm architectural divisions that were in the 1535 title page. In the great Bible title page, hierarchy and division are in part reduced, in part relativized. It depicts a class society, but divisions are not firm. 
The king is near God's place, and all levels of society are connected and separated by the word. The scrolls flow into adjoining scenes to form both a fluid boundary and a link between classes. Hierarchy and order in this society depend on scripture. The king's throne itself rests on the Bible, that is, the center title panel, which in turn balances atop a slender tree trunk, as if a, slender, as if a single shake could topple the monarch and thus the rest of society. Encircling the tree trunk are the commons, content for now to support the monarchy. The engraving tells the whole complex story. The king's authority rests on scripture. The king himself authorizes and dispenses the word in God's place. The dispensing of the word is critical to legitimate the power of the king. You may think we're overreading as we talk about the king resting on a, on a Bible that rests on a tree that could be shaken by the commons. It's a metaphor that's, that the translators themselves often referred to. Cut not the bow that thou standest upon, whose literal sense is oppress not the commons. Or Coverdale teaches, the poor and they that be under support and bear up the rich and mighty as pillars do the house. Without the help and service of such, the rulers are not able to live in their dignity and calling one day. Around this time, in 1542, one of the strangest and most ridiculed moments in English Bible translation occurs when Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, proposes that an English Bible should be Latinized. Archbishop Cranmer had polled the bishops, and a majority of them judged the great Bible of 1539 too flawed to retain unless it were purged by careful comparison with the commonly read and received Latin Vulgate text. Two weeks later, Gardner provided for the record a list of about 100 Latin words and phrases and desired that for their genuine and native meaning and for the majesty of the matter in them contained, these words might be retained in their own nature as much as might be or be very fitly Englished with the least alteration. Is it possible that Bishop Gardner wanted a Bible with such hybrid passages as these, whosoever committeth peccatum is servus peccati? And when Simon saw that through impositione manus apostolorum, spiritus sanctus was given, he offered the money. The best, however, is still, this is my dialect son in whom complacui. <laughs> what are we to make of this proposal for a macaronic Bible? Gardner wishes to preserve the language of scripture, a language that demands and yet defies perfect transmission because it is the vehicle for mystery. Reformers and early translators accused traditionalists of keeping scripture secret in order to maintain deception and protect clerical power. But mystery and aura may also name that which is unfathomable and yet powerfully efficacious. The conservatives and the reformers hold different conceptions of language and of God. For the traditionalists, God is inscrutable in his knowledge, and so God's word is difficult. Therefore, the church must aid in interpretation. But for the Protestant reformers, God is inscrutable in his will, but his word is lucid. For the Protestants, faith requires not awe before mystery, but submission before decree. Just as for the Catholics, faith requires submission to holy church. When the Catholics regain power in England, uh, when Henry VIII and his son, Edward, have both uh, passed on and Mary comes to the throne, Protestants flee into exile. There they produce what might be the most scholarly and most reader friendly of all these translations, the Geneva Bible of 1560. It now is famed mostly because people thought its notes were contentious. We can question that if you stop and really bother to open the book. It's true, however, though, that this Bible was seen as, we might say, the most radical, the Bible that swings the pendulum furthest to the left. And it motivated two other translations, the Bishop's Bible in 1568, and then because the Bishop's Bible never supplanted it, it motivated the King James translation of the Bible. 
So the Bishop's Bible then was officially the Bible of the church. It was also then the draft that the King James translators took as the basis of their work. In the intervening years between the late 1560s, when the Bishop's Bible came out, and, the, and 1604, when King James um, authorized the work for a new translation, the English church was riven by dissension, particularly by the Protestants, who challenged church authority and, and secular authority as well. Queen Elizabeth wrote to King James before he ever came to the throne that these Protestants posed a threat to their privilege and posed a perilous uh, issue for their future. As a result, people rose in the English church who were opponents of dissent. People like Richard Bancroft, the Bishop of London. Puritanism was hounded and driven underground. Others, more irenic by temperament, nevertheless sided completely with and defended the, the ecclesiastical structures of the established church, people like Lancelot Andrews. Out of this disagreement came, in 1604, the gathering that gives us the King James translation of the Bible. James was presented with a petition, a millinery petition, by a thousand ministers asking that the church be further reformed along the lines of the hotter sort of Protestants, the Puritans. James partly to assuage the, their concerns, but mostly to display his own theological acumen, convened a conference at Hampton Court in 1604. They invited four Puritans who arrived and were met with uh, an overwhelming majority of um, orthodox establishment figures. The translation of the King James Version of the Bible was merely a sop thrown to the Puritans, the only concession that was made, and was in fact intended by the king as a final blow against the Geneva Bible. Out of that, then, we get this one, the King James Version of the Bible. And finally, we come to this book, beautifully printed. But for our purposes, I'd like us to look most at this, these, this document right here, the rules to be observed in translation. These instructions were issued by Richard Bancroft, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, who said these were the king's own rules. Most astounding is that in this document that guides the translators, we see no hint of requiring a spiritual frame of mind, seeking inspiration, or going to the Lord in prayer. This is a document of efficient administration merely. Rules 1 to 5 deal with consistency and, conserv and conservatism. Not the best translation, but the only authorized one would be followed. The Geneva Bible's glossary translating biblical names would not do. The central battles of the Reformation over church and congregation, priest and elder, were settled on the side mostly of tradition and antiquity, avoiding innovation or even reform. Rules 6 and 7 rule out commentary, avoiding both contention and settled clarity, and opt for richness. Scripture is seen as unified. It interprets itself, one place explaining another. Rules 8 to 10 lay out the workings of the joint enterprise with increasing degrees of integration. Nothing is the work of one man. All eight members of a company translate the same chapters and then confer with each other. All six companies supervise the other companies. The six directors meet at the end to resolve disagreements. Rules 11 through 15 increase the sense of hierarchy and control. The company directors included Lancelot Andrews, 
whom we met before, defender of episcopacy. William Barlow, the Dean of Chester and the Royal Chaplain, keeping Puritan uh, favorite texts, the epistles of St. Paul, safely out of the Puritans' hands. And the four other companies were led by King's professors of Hebrew and Greek at Oxford and Cambridge. The official status of the Bishop's Bible is loosened a bit in this allowance of Tyndale and others in Rule 14. Note that the rules omit the Catholic English translation from Rems, but the translators consulted it anyway. Why? Well, most of their work was done in other languages. Many of these translators were men who were actually uncomfortable speaking English. They, are, they had lived in the learned world and spoken Latin so exclusively for so long. Nevertheless, they were fully aware of the disputes that had emerged in the 1580s and 90s once the Catholics had published their translation in Rems. Gregory Martin had attacked the English translation, and William Folk, the Puritan, had responded in behalf of the English. Martin's discovery of the manifold corruptions of the Holy Scriptures by the heretics of our days, and Folk's defense of the sincere and true translations of the Holy Scriptures, argued over which were better, the Septuagint or Masoretic texts of the Hebrew Bible, the Latin or the Greek New Testament, and whether in the language Protestant or Catholic terms were preferable. Martin asked, uh, charged, such are the absurd translations of the English Bibles, namely when they translate congregation for church, elder for priest, image for idol, dissension for schism, and such like. Uh, William Folk responded with a complete text of the Catholic Remish New Testament, glossed with his confutation of everything in it. When the King James translators sat down to look at English, previous English translations, what did they have at hand? In 1605, in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, there were two English Bibles, a great Bible and folk, this one here. We know of the, the library of at least one of the translators, William Branthwaite. His library included two only English Bibles, among dozens, scores, of continental and Latin texts. His two were the Geneva Bible and Folk. As a result, their awareness of the Catholic and Protestant arguments works its way into every discussion. In the passages we compare now, I'd like us to remain aware that Tyndale's translation was picked up in the Matthew Bible, and that was the basis for the Great Bible. The Great Bible was the basis for the Bishop's Bible, and the Bishop's Bible was the text that the King James translators were to refer to. So, when Tyndale and the Great Bible and the Bishop's Bible wrote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my congregation, and when the Catholic translation says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, what's the difference? It's just a word. Church with a capital C, congregation, a local parish. The King James Version here goes with the Catholics to establish a church and not a congregational um, assembly. Sometimes they go with the Puritans and the Protestants. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. The Catholic translation had said, what shall we do, men and brethren? But Peter said unto them, do penance. What's the difference? In one, your mind changes. In the other, you recite 12 Hail Marys and go back to the priest. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. Be penitent and believe the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hebrews, seeing then that we have a great high priest which has entered into heaven, I mean Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold our profession. 
What's the difference between that and the Catholic translation? Having therefore a great high priest that had entered the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold the confession. Both can mean simply keep your testimony and proclaim it to the world. But surely the latter suggests going to shrift as well. Tyndale and his successors wrote, ordain elders in every city. The Catholic translation said, those are priests. What difference would it make if a Roman Catholic opens his Bible and finds there are no priests except for Caiaphas and Ananias and the ones who put Jesus to death? Sometimes it's not word choice. Sometimes it's grammar. There's a marvelous misplaced modifier. Or we might think it a very carefully placed modifier. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye you also ought to wash one another's feet. The Catholic translation. If then I have washed your feet, Lord and Master, you also ought... That's Jesus talking to Peter. You move that Lord and Master, and Jesus becomes the servant to Peter, the Lord and Master. Why do that? Oh, that's right. It has something to do with Peter and the papacy. Here's a translation that establishes papacy from the time that Christ is on earth. The Protestants and the Catholics battled over whether faith or works, whether the gospel or the law were the basis of salvation. So Tyndale translates, I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. The Catholic translation modifies that. Do not think I am come to break the law. I'm not come to break, but to fulfill. Jesus never breaks the law. Jesus obeys things. Subtle, but real differences. Tyndale translated, thou hast faith and I have deeds or works. Show me thy faith by thy deeds, and I will show thee my faith by my deeds. The Catholic translated, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I'll show thee by works my faith. Our translation is closer to the Catholic one. It's the one we like. But Tyndale's is actually closer to the Greek of the Textus Receptus of um, Erasmus's Greek that he's translating from. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the chief of these is love. That's not the way we remember it. Here the King James Version gave over to the Catholics a word that moves us from an inner state of mind and heart to a word that suggests outward works and deeds. Even in tiny little places, we suggest the questions of power that had divided Protestants and Catholics. The scepter of thy kingdom, Christ, is a right scepter, a real scepter, a true scepter. Christ's kingdom supplants any earthly kingdom. The King James Version follows Rems, who had said, a scepter of justice. They change it to a scepter of righteousness. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, the scepter of Christ's kingdom is a metaphor rather than a more excellent scepter than the earthly scepters. As the translation drew to a close, the translators truly felt that scholarship and, and um, communication had resolved the differences. Their confidence is shown in the fact that they give more prominence to a Puritan in writing the prefatory matter than anywhere else in the translation. Miles Smith, who is perhaps the most Puritan of the translators, goes along with Thomas Bilson, who is perhaps the most anti-Puritan of the translators. And together, 
they collaborate on the prefatory matter. And out of struggle comes peace. Surely there were disputes that had remained. The Geneva Bible had said, his charge let another take. The Bishop's Bible had written, his office let another take. The King James Version, his bishopric let another take. Richard Bancroft, that opponent of dissent, had insisted on that glorious word bishopric. Miles Smith had objected, but he wrote that Bancroft is so potent there's no contradicting him. And yet, Tyndale had written, his bishopric let another take. Why would Tyndale have allowed bishops into this? Well, he was no Puritan yet, but there's another reason. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 20. Whose office, whose charge is, is being filled at this point? They're talking about Judas Iscariot. The Puritans are happy to let him be the bishop. The translators drew on all these previous drafts from Tyndale through the Bishop's Bible. They drew with remarkable scholarship on continental scholars and translations as well, and aimed to make one principal good translation. And they agree with those who had come before. The scripture isn't just a doctrine that sits there. It is a force that changes us. The scriptures will instruct us, bring us home, reform us, comfort us, quicken us, inflame us. Therefore, we too are called upon to act. Tola lege, take up and read. Translation opens the window to let in the light, breaks the shell so we can eat the kernel, puts aside the curtain so that we can peek into the Holy of Holies, removes the cover of the well so that we can come to the water even as Jacob rolled away the stone from the mouth of the well by which means the flocks of Laban were watered. Indeed, without translation into the vulgar tongue, the unlearned are but like children of Jacob's well, without a bucket or something to draw with. We, they tell us, are brought into fountains of living water which ye dig not. Do not cast earth into them. If light be come into the world, love not darkness more than light. If food, if clothing be offered, go not naked and starve not yourselves. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but a blessed thing it is and will bring us to everlasting blessedness in the end when God speaketh unto us to hearken, when he setteth his word before us to read it, when he stretcheth out his hand and calleth to answer, here am I. When the translators in this imaginary scene bestowed their translation on King James for his approval, what they gave him was a thoroughly safe and relatively conservative translation of the Bible. A Bible that would end many disputes and suppress others. It took centuries for that to happen. For you and me, the Bible as we sit to read it is a, is a source of remarkable peace and spiritual serenity. But it's just that much more interesting if we're aware of the turmoil suppressed in those decisions. The, let's, we're, let's turn to, over the next century, Bible readers would rise up against their king, would stage a revolution, would put their king on trial for treason, and would behead him. The rationale for that was, was done by the Solicitor General of England, who drew his inspiration from the King James Version and the Geneva Bible of the Old Testament. If you would like to be someone who changes the world, if you would like to go do something radical or subversive, pick up your Bible. Thank you. <laughs>